Sheila? Can you hear me? Yeah. I was yeah. just playing. How are Sorry. you? <laughs> Doing good. Oh, there we are. <laughs> we are live. That's good. Yeah, we're back again. Another Wednesday, another open science and reproducibility stream. Um, nice to see you again. Good to see you too, Micah. What do you got? Today I have chai. Mm, mm-hmm. I went uh, again and visited our friends at Global Village, and this time I got a medium. Oh, nice! <laughs> it seemed like a, a you know the sun shining here in the in the <laughs> triangle for the first time in four days. I was feeling good, so I got a larger than usual tea. <laughs> Plus, everyone needs more chai. Yeah, this, yeah. I um, I want to tell you about one of my greatest fears, and then a, a weird social interaction that I had going to get this tea. So my, one of my greatest fears is, so I'm, I'm in my office, I'm on campus, um, coming down here just to use the, the data connection here. Um, and I, you know, go across the street to get a tea. And every time I leave, I am so worried that I'm going to leave my keys in my office. And then I'll be like stuck out there when we're supposed to be like in here talking and I'm just be out there no. in the hallway drinking my tea. So I, I do like three or I like hold the door open and do three or four checks. Do I have my keys? Do I have my keys? Um, so it's good that uh, it hasn't happened yet. But if it happens next week, then who knows what. <laughs> um, and then the weird social interaction. So, you know, we're, um, I was talking to my wife the other week about how strangely like so, – the, the entirety of society and culture has changed in a year, right? So I was walking across to get um, to get the tea and I had my mask on. And you remember when you used to walk past people on campus and sometimes you would see them a long way off and, you know, you would make eye contact and then do a little smile or something, right? Just like good yeah. social cues that you do with people that you see. So someone was w walking this way and I was about to pass them and – Without thinking about it, I, I realized, or I, okay, so I didn't think, but what I did was sort of like an, an eye raise to say, oh, hey, how are you? Um, and then yeah. the, this guy did the eye raise also. And then like three steps after that, after we passed each other, I was like, oh, my behavior, my social behavior has changed. Like I didn't even attempt a, a little smile because I knew. Oh, he really? Yeah. Like not even under? No, it did. Like my face didn't move. It was all like this area right here. <laughs> Which, which is good and cool. I'm glad I'm adapting, but it's uh, it's a little strange, right? Yeah. I definitely still smile under my mask, but I started actually waving because mm. I feel like it's more clear of an indication that I'm saying hi. Sure. So, sure. Yeah. Well, uh, if anyone is watching, listening, our, our viewer listeners, feel free to tell us what you're drinking this morning. Um and uh, update us on your strange behavior changes and social interactions. We have our uh, expert moderator in the chat, and Sheila and I are watching it also. And, uh-oh. And special guest. <laughs> our special guest is here already. <laughs> Hi, Cassidy. Hi, what's up? <laughs> Nothing. We're, we're just talking about how social interactions have changed in the, in the pandemic life. And now here we are with you online. <laughs> Social interactions? Yeah, I was I was saying that I like I was walking to I go across the street to Global Village to get a tea every time before we stream. So I did a thing where I like said hi with my eyes rather than a, a smile as I passed someone on the on the sidewalk. Um so it's it's strange. I was at the um at the butchers, like a little store. I don't eat meat, but that's why it sounds weird to say it. I was at the butchers, but I was buying some fish. And I think I both said something about cannibalism and might have proposed to the woman working at the counter at some point. Like, I mean, it was all very, like, but I just said, you know, I Instacart everything. So I'd only gone because I needed like a special, like I needed lobster. And so I went to this place and yeah, I was, it was pretty awkward. Mm. It was, it was pretty uncomfortable. Um, so I can't go back there ever again. Yeah, obviously. not ever. So, oh, no. I mean, they'll just be... Just I mean, wear a different buy, mask. Why do you buy lobster in Indiana anyway? I mean, it's not okay. So it's probably for the better. I probably won't die now of some horrible, like, fishborne disease. But. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, well, I'll int introduce you and welcome you in just a second. But I want to say uh, hi to Douglas, who's uh, on our stream. Um, he says he's drinking a dark roast coffee, coffee roasted locally in Western North Carolina. Right on, Douglas. Do you Thanks. allow that on this? Um, allow what? Other people to talk? Coffee. Oh, I mean, it's, that's I a good... this was like a tea thing only. We haven't discussed that, Sheila. What do you think? I feel like coffee is like <laughs> kind of... For... I don't know. I think it's fine. Coffee is I the mean, tea of America. Like... <laughs> or like it's like... Yeah, just tea, but not leaves. I don't know. <laughs> You're still soaking something in water. So. Great point. Soaked, soaked beverage. What are you, What are you drinking, Cassidy? Chai. I thought we had to drink chai. So I mean, Cheer. it's a basic Cheers. Army and Sons chai because I couldn't go to, you know, I can't go out in public, obviously, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Great. Well, um, we've got some other coffee drinkers in the in the chat here. Thank you all for being with <laughs> us. Um, I'll do the brief introduction. So thank you. Um, everyone for watching and listening. Cassidy for being here. Sheila, as always. Uh, on the screen, you see our schedule of upcoming um, talks and past talks. We've covered Earl Grey literature, uh, open kombucha knowledge last week, today credit contributors in chai with our special guest, and then next week, uh, diversity, documentation, and Darjeeling. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, Cassidy, uh, I was going to tell our origin story, and then um, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, so the, the first and only book review I've ever done kind of came out of nowhere. I was sort of early in my career. Someone said, hey, will you re 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 review this book? And I was like, I don't know how to read a book and review it, but I did. Um, but it was Beyond Bibliometrics, which was uh, Dr. Sugimoto and Blaise Cronin, right? Yeah. And um, got it was sort of my, my first introduction to this wild world of bibliometrics, right sort of on the front end of how things were shifting toward altmetrics, which we'll talk about a little bit today. Um, and I don't remember how exactly this happened, but I was so enthralled by the book, uh, you know, um, collection of essays, um, started looking deeper into your work. And I think I just emailed you out of the blue eventually and said, this is amazing and groundbreaking stuff. Um, and we ended up on a, a team together studying contributorship for a week here in North Carolina at the Triangle Scholarly Communication Network in 2015, long time ago. Um, and have uh, stayed in touch since. We'll, um, I don't know if you know this, but we're going to visit Leiden, or we're, we're going to visit the Netherlands later today, so we'll tell that Leiden story a little bit later. But uh, can you do your two-minute introduction, Cassidy? Uh, Sheila's never met you also. <laughs> Hi, Sheila. I'm Cassidy. Um, I'm a professor of informatics at Indiana University Bloomington, um, but I was in North Carolina for nine years um, at the other school. So I was at UNC um, for an undergrad in music performance and then a master's degree in library science and then a PhD there. So it's sort of one of those vortexes that just like you try to get out, but you can't. Um, so then I came to Bloomington after that. And as, as Micah said, yeah, we I was able to go back to the Triangle for the Scholarly Communication Institute, which is just fantastic. And it was my birthday. And so I walked into the room on my birthday and Micah had like decorated a chair and there were balloons and streamers and it was not understated in any way and so um, that's when I knew we would be friends for life that's right that's awesome so, so when he said hey you want to come drink tea and talk about contributorship today I was like of course absolutely of course I do <laughs> awesome um Sheila why don't you introduce a little of your work and, and yourself to, to Cassidy so we're all on the same page here yeah, so I'm a postdoctoral researcher at NC State in the Department of Bio and Ag Engineering. And I study like water resources and specifically like water quality and water quantity. Um, and I've always been like very interested in open and reproducible science. And that's kind of that's how Micah and I connected is through my um, postdoctoral advisor, Dr. Natalie Nelson. So yeah, it's been it's been fun doing these tea talks and also working with Mike on other open science like projects too. So. Yeah, somehow we are like, I I got roped into a paper. Eventually, I'm gonna rope <laughs> you into something. It's yeah, it's it's becoming a oh, it's becoming a collaboration. What how apropos <laughs> for our topic? Um, 
We had some, uh, I usually do a little bit of research about the tea that we're doing, and I was so enthralled by Cassidy's research that I did not look into anything about tea. Sheila, do you have anything on chai? Like, what do we know about chai? Or Cassidy, do you know anything about chai that we should know? <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, I know that the word chai, like, literally means tea. And it was interesting because last week we talked about kombucha and cha also in Japanese, cha is tea. Mm. So, yeah, it's, I think it's interesting that, like, yeah, it's just when people say chai, they actually mean, like, tea. But I don't know, like, I, I don't know, like, what common things are in it um other than like maybe coriander or not coriander cardamom and maybe cinnamon but maybe it varies by place like what spices are in your chai i don't know any thoughts cassidy <laughs> you know this is one of those things where i always worry about like horrible cultural appropriation of this when I go in and ask for a chai tea and it's and I know that that is inappropriate right it's a tea tea and but it definitely has come up with sort of its own understanding within the American context of what you're getting when you get a chai which is going to be sort of a Christmas spice infused <laughs> drink usually with some form of steamed milk attached to it so um, yeah I wish that I had a better understanding of the roots of of that term and also what chai should, what should constitute a real chai. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we chatted a little bit when we were uh, doing the Earl Grey talk about um, like the difference between milk and tea and like calling something a tea latte, right? So I have a chai latte, which maybe we have a burry. Oh, Douglas has something. Uh, there's two yeah. major ways of pronouncing tea, chai cha, or more the a Asian countries, while tea is used in English and some other uh, Western languages. Ah, okay. Thanks, Douglas. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know if like what I'm drinking, that the chai latte is different than a chai with, you know, milk added to it. Um, well, have you guys talked about Fisher's experience, experiments and the birth of statistics and its relationship to tea. No, please. No. Enlighten what? Us. Because I mean, this is this group of all groups should be. There's a, let's see if I can reach it on my bookshelf. Oh my here. goodness. There is a fabulous book called The Lady Tasting Tea, and it's really up. about the birth of statistics. And so, you know, of course, Fisher is at this salon party, and there's this woman there, and she's like, oh, I can always taste whether you put the milk in first or the tea in first, right? And this is, you know, a sign of her pedigree that she can tell the difference, right? And so it needs to be prepared appropriately. And Fisher's like, oh man, there is no way that you can actually tell. She's like, I can. He's like, ah, I could devise an experiment, right? So he goes back and he's like, this tea has it in first, this doesn't. He tries to randomize it. And, you know, what kind of sample size would we need? And how much does she have to do? And so she's doing it. And then she's drinking and, you know, trying to say whether it has, the milk in first or, or the milk in second. And then he's describing how you can calculate whether that's significant enough in order to justify oh. her claim. And she can, she could tell the difference. This is amazing. In first or last. This is yeah. so cool. But anyway, so that's like the opening chapter of this book and it kind of goes through it. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic one. Uh, I'm, I'm, you can't see it, um, Cassidy, but the, or people on the stream can see it. I'm looking at an, uh, article in nature about, it's sort of a, a review of the book. I'll put it in the zoom chat so you can, I'm sure you've seen it before. Yeah, this is awesome. Sheila, we should have done our homework. Good thing we have a guest. I did other homework. <laughs> <laughs> Not that homework. Um, awesome. cool. Um, Sheila, you had a question for me about kombucha. Do you want to uh, take us back a week there? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, Micah, after last week's chatting about kombucha, did you, do you think you'll give it a second chance or is it still some like sour, weird science experiment? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Yes and yes. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm invested in um, in our collaboration, Sheila, and wherever that takes us. So what I, what I, what I would really love is when, when we could gather together again, we'll take a picture of this and put it on our 
Twitter or something. Um, I would love to try some of your kombucha. I forget which uh, yeah. which flavors you mentioned, but one of them sounded really good to me. Um, if you could, there, I've, I'm like learning. I'm how old am I now? Thirty seven, thirty eight, something like that. I'm learning so much about myself as a as a like a almost middle aged adult, and I've realized that there are two flavors that any any like if they're in anything, I will um, enjoy it, and that's smoke flavor because barbecue is a big big fan of barbecue and citrus. So if there were a way to make a kombucha that had, was like a smoky citrus, I would pour it on sausage and, and eat it. Yeah. I've had a, a kombucha that was grapefruit and sage. And Ooh. that combination Ooh. was pretty good. Um, and I'm very picky. I mean, I've tried probably, yeah, I probably like one out of 25 kombuchas that I try. Um, but the grapefruit sage, that could be your sort of savory citrus combo that you need, Mega. That sounds really great. Um, Cassidy, I will... bet there's also a way to put smoke flavor in kombucha. I don't know if I would like it that. It sounds but... disgusting. Absolutely yeah. disgusting. I mean, I'm horrified. <laughs> but I'm thinking, like, somebody has done it. Th- there are cocktails that do that well, right? Like, mm-hmm. I can't remember the name. The sage barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I, before I didn't eat meat, I had a champagne that had um, stock in it, like chicken stock in it. Huh. And it was actually really good. Uh, one of my favorite cocktails of all time. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the bar now. It was in Tallahassee when I lived in Tallahassee. They had made a cocktail called Bone Apple Tea, and it had oh, what's that? What's the mushroom? Shita- it had shiitake mushroom uh, powder on on like. The, the top layer that was like the, the foamy layer amazing um cassidy uh we're like we're developing inside jokes uh in the uh in the stream here um could you tell us uh Wait, can i see this stream it feels really weird sure it's it. it's yeah. at uh twitch dot what is it ncsu libraries yeah. It might be weird because you'll you'll hear us like three seconds after. Um, what yeah, you have, to mute, you have it. to mute it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Here, I'll send it in the chat just in case. Okay. okay private jokes. Let's hear it. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, inside joke. Um, do you have a favorite? It's not really a joke. Favorite tea and why? Uh, and I'll also extend that to kombucha uh, and why. Yes, I do have, um, I have tea. I organize my day by different teas. I think it's fair to say. So I'm an Earl Grey in the morning. Like that's my first tea of the day. It's always Earl Grey. Um, and then once I finish the Earl Grey, I usually move on to sort of harder black teas. So, you know, I'll do a Tower of London or I'll do a, you know, an English breakfast or a Darjeeling, like something a little bit like more intense. And then depending on how much work I have to do, I'll move to like a green tea, but I am now to the age where I can't handle like a gunpowder tea. My heart just <laughs> races like crazy. And of course this is cause it's like my eighth tea of the day. So I've had a lot of caffeine at this point. Um, so I'll kind of like moderate on my green teas depending on where I am. And then I move to Tassan. So in the evening I do like turmeric, lemon, ginger concoctions with, you know, honey and different spaces in there. And then eventually move to like a lavender or something, you know, very soothing before I go to bed. I'm not a chamomile fan though, really. Hmm. I, I mean, in a pinch, but not a fan, not a dandelion fan either. So kind of picky about the tassons. You may have the most comprehensive tea drinking habit I've ever heard <laughs> of and, and well thought out and well described. Yes, very well Thanks. thought. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that's great. I'd love to... Uh, there's, there must be a study we could come up with of uh, <laughs> Cassidy's tea intake. Um, it's intense. Yeah. We, we has s- it always been like that, Cassidy, <laughs> or has it evolved? My mom is a big tea drinker. Um, and so that probably started a lot of this, is that it's sort of a comfort thing. Um, and I tried coffee in college, you know, during my experimental times. But coffee and I are just not it's fine. I'll take a coffee every once in a while, but I don't love it. I don't know. I like the flavors of tea. I like the variety of tea. I'm also always cold. 
So it's really soothing for me just to be able to cup a hot beverage all of the time. So, yeah. The collection has oh. grown over time. <laughs> I admit to that. The collection is a little intense. Do you, okay, I got to show my thing. Do you do you have a mustache cup, though? I do not have a mustache cup. Have you ever seen one of these? Yes, I think I need one in my future. <laughs> um, uh, watch out in your mail. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, maybe I should just start getting mustache cups. I'll send them as uh, as gifts to uh, every time someone is a guest on the exactly. on the stream. You get a mustache okay. cup. <laughs> I love it. I will send you a picture over Twitter with me and my mustache. Ah, that would be so amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I did want to uh, mention, so we've we've had a, a, a long time viewer, three weeks now, um, Woodson, who uh, I, is a, a colleague of mine, and he says that in California, um, they have a kombucha on tap that he has seen that has citrus and some kind of smoky flavor. So... Um, Watch out, California. When 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 I can get on a plane or rent an RV and drive across the country, I'm gonna come and find that kombucha. Um, let's let's talk science or open science or information science. Um, I did want to just say thank you again to our our friends and colleagues at the Reproducibility Organization, uh, started over there at the University of Oxford. Um, last time we were on here, Sheila, we visited Oxford. Uh, the Oxford Internet Institute had a, a live stream camera, but I figured since um, Cassidy has a, a Dutch connection, and I also uh, spent some time in the Netherlands, that we would visit the Netherlands today. So, uh, Cassidy, if you're watching the stream any second now, we should be transported to the Netherlands. How do I see the comments while I'm watching the stream, Micah? I'm I'm a new to Twitch person. Yeah, I, I think I, there's like a it's a slider like a out tab. Yeah, yeah, or like a tab along the top, and it says chat, and then it'll pop out a chat window. <laughs> I'll make it work. Continue, Micah. Continue. Yeah. Oh well, we're uh, Sheila's a water person, so I found this cool map called at windy.com. Can you see it, Sheila? Um, it's like showing uh, the oh, cool. wave. Um, I don't give me words, Sheila. I don't know what this is. It's showing like waves. the velocity field or something. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, of wind. That's oh, cool. waves. We can look at wind too. Let's oh, look waves. At wind. Okay. Sec, I gotta get it working here. Let's look at wind. It was pretty windy. I've been I've been doing this all morning, looking, <laughs> playing with this uh, this thing to see what's happening in the Netherlands. Um, this this thing is fun and cool, and we could talk about how it is or isn't open science. But the best part is that this little um, graphic here is places where you can go paragliding. Yeah, so like there's all these paragliding spots along the edge of the Netherlands and you know uh, the UK on the other side and yeah. So I was I was like playing with wind and temperature and clouds and I said paragliding, of course I'm going to look at that. Fun fact, like hydrology fun fact. Um there are a lot of hydrologists in the Netherlands because they're so close to sea level and they have to protect themselves um, because of that. So I have a, actually quite a few hydrologist friends from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, Cassidy, what's what's your connection there? I, 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 I will look at one of your papers in a little bit, but how did that begin, your, your connection with um, at the University of Leiden, yeah? How did that begin? I mean, we had gone... So Vassan and I had gone there before for some STI conferences and we and were- And STI to, is? Uh, the Science Technology Indicators Conference. Um, so we'd gone there for a couple of conferences. So it's hosted in Leiden and then the other year it's hosted somewhere else. So it's every other year it's back in Leiden. And so we had started conversations with people there. Paul Bowders was the director at the time and he decided he wanted to start some visiting professorships which they hadn't had previously. So. That was back in 2013, I want to say, something like that. So 
Uh, Vincent and I started a visiting professorship there. So we would go four to six times a year, um, stay for a week or so. Um, and yeah, just, it sort of became a home away from home. So I'm, I deeply miss Leiden. I haven't been there. This is the longest I haven't been to Leiden in probably eight years. So I miss it a lot. It's a fantastic town. Sheila, you were telling me earlier about your brief experience in the Netherlands. Uh, do you want to describe it for us? Yeah, I, so I, I was like a visiting researcher in, at Bonn University for a few months and in Germany. And it, it's like so close that I have a bunch of, and I have a bunch of hydrologist friends in Delft. So I would, I, one weekend I took the train to Delft and that was really fun. And people in the lab in Germany were like, how come you're traveling so far on the weekends? And I was like, have you ever been to the States? Cause like we travel like four hours to get to places all the time. So it's not like that far for me. Um, and also like trains are awesome. So mm -hmm. yeah. So. Agreed. Yeah, we're we're looking at the at the I think there's uh, the port of Rotterdam right now, but um, next we'll go to there's like a a train crossing live cam and I um so I, I spent time in, in in Maastricht and and traveled around a lot and I when I saw the train stream earlier I was trying to put this all together I had such a weird feeling of like home homesickness right like I lived there for six months and I saw that that um. I forget what the trains are called now, but the, you know, the yellow and blue, like that you just see them everywhere. And it was like a, yeah, like a, a, a weird moment of homesickness for the Netherlands. Uh, um, let's look at, I have, um, Cassidy, your paper that you sent to us about meta research, or it's included in a collection in the journal Biochemistry and Chemical Biology. Um, could you describe for us what meta research is? I've I I've actually sort of started to adopt that because that phrase for what I do because no one really understands what um, like I'm, I don't function as a normal librarian often. Um, what does meta research mean for you? And then we'll get into the paper a little bit. Yeah, and this is of course a a more complicated answer with a lot of political nuance in it. So. Um, there are a lot of people now who are organizing around the term science of science and it's sort of a renewal around that term, largely people who are coming from physics and complex systems who are moving into science studies. Now, of course, science of science was a word used since the, a phrase used since the 1950s with Derek DeSola Price and others who sort of defined that as a field. But over time that became what scientometricians did. And so scientometrics became the word and that was really looking at how do we understand science using the metadata available on different publications. So there was a very sort of narrow scope for it. So in parallel, you have the sociologists of science who are asking about the social organization of science. So you have sort of looking at the metadata, looking at the social organization, while this science of science is sort of laying dormant underneath it. So then complex systems comes on and they sort of want to renew this term science of science but people in both the sociology and the scientometrics camps are saying, wait, but that's, that's what we've been doing for decades, right? That's our term. Um, and in parallel with that, you have a lot of people who were doing the reproducibility work um, and the open science work saying, well, it's meta science or it's meta research. It's research about research. It's, it's research about science. It's science about science, right? And so it's, again, all of it is evoking this idea of us taking the tools, our epistemological tools that we have, whether we're coming from ethnography, whether, you know, whether we're coming from sociology or from history or um, from sociology and bringing those tools to study the process of science itself or the process of research itself. I think a lot of people want to use meta research rather than meta science because they feel it excludes other forms of evidence that are maybe not scientific. I think most people who use meta science or science of science, though, are really thinking it in the Germanic way of sort of Wissenschaft, like knowledge productions rather than thinking of it as sciences versus the humanities or the social sciences. So I think, again, as I said, it's kind of a political thing. All of those words are really just saying, how do we understand how knowledge is made, how um, knowledge is disseminated, how knowledge is consumed? That's really what we're talking about in all of those different ways, but they come with sort of the baggage of 
these different epistemological frameworks and sort of um, institutional camps. I'm, I'm so glad that you brought the German in. Uh, I've been trying I, I, here uh, when we were trying to figure out how, what term we want to use at NC State. Uh, open science makes a lot of sense for a lot of our work. Uh, Sheila, I, I think that you would identify most with that term. But we do, we do, the library especially serves uh, soft sciences and the humanities and the arts here on campus. So mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to find the right term. So I keep saying, let's just do Wissenschaft. The, the <laughs> Office of Open Wissenschaft. Everyone will love it. Um, Metavisen or something. Yeah. We could definitely have that. <laughs> it, it hasn't stuck yet. <laughs> um, Sheila, do you want to get into, let, let's talk about contributorship a little bit. Where do you want to start, Sheila? Yeah, we, I mean, we could start with like credit stuff. What is, what, is, Sheila, what is credit? I had to look it up. <laughs> I mean, I know what it is like in practice, but like officially. Um, yeah, so it stands like the CR and the T are capitalized. <laughs> and it stands for Contributor Roles Taxonomy. I'm not sure where the E D I is. Maybe they just you gotta make it. Yeah, you gotta make a word out of it. <laughs> um, but it does make like it works. Um, and it's it was developed through the consortium consortia of advancing standards in research administration C A S R A I. Casra, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and through the National Information Standards Organization. And ISO, which I did not know any of that. But um, I guess, like, as a postdoc, where I, or, you know, in, if we have grad students or undergrads watching, or even professors, um, it's basically at the end of your research uh, articles, you'll have like an acknowledgments or an author contribu contributions section. And there is like a very specific way that they've asked for people to like describe their contributions so that it can it can be like classified and documented. Um, and that's basically what credit taxonomy does is it like classifies all the different types of tasks that you might do when contributing to like a research article and offers some sort of like standard way to like share that. Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, you, you covered it really well. And like all those acronyms and organizations are, are things that are familiar in, in, in library and information science. Um, I, I have up Cassidy's paper so we can look at how they how, how the credit taxonomy is implemented. Um, Cassidy, what's your um, b background? Um, can you tell us how this connects with bibliometrics? And then um, I'd love to hear you describe, like I read this study, of course, but I'd love to hear you describe it for our, our listener viewers. I did really read Amazing, it. Amazing, Micah. <laughs> yeah, so just a little bit of background and history on it is that again, as I said before, science of science and scientometrics uses the metadata on publications to make a lot of claims about science. And so we're restricted to that byline, right? Where it says who the authors are. Now, when there was only one author, it was easy to think about credit and responsibility, right? It goes to that one author. And then there were two authors and we could kind of manage that. And then there were three authors. And now we're in an environment where we have over 5,000 authors. And so the increasing team size made people stop and say, are the bylines sufficient for telling us information about who wrote this article, what they did to warrant authorship, right? So in parallel with these increasing team size, we have all of these sort of abuses, right? This honorific authorship where people are added on to the author byline, even though they didn't do anything, or ghost authorship, people who should have been on the byline, but they weren't there at all. And so with all of these things going on, there was really a rallying cry that authorship was sort of breaking down in its ability to be informative. And so this was largely coming from the biomedical sciences. So Rennie, other people in that space, JAMA, BMJ, Lancet, all of their editors were calling out and saying, we're having these massive abuses going on in authorship, you know, because we have such an emphasis from this reward system and evaluative system of science. So we need a new way. We need to be able to be more precise about what you did to warrant authorship. So a lot of medical journals started adopting this and they would 
just write this out, but it was really idiosyncratic and it was embedded in the PDFs of the articles basically. So if you're an information scientist or thinking about documentation, if you wanted to do any studies, you would have had to pull down the PDFs, OCR the PDFs, clean that OCR, and then what you would have is a list of 20,000 different types of contributorship with some initials that you had to match back to authors that were still embedded in the PDF. So it was pretty impossible. So even though journals have been doing this for decades, there weren't really large scale studies on, studies on this until PLOS One adopted a taxonomy. And this is preceded credit. And it was really just an idiosyncratic kind of thing of five major categories. And I apologize for the puppy, a very hyper Labrador in the other room. That's all right. Um, so they had all of these studies. And so they were starting to collect these data at scale. And you could pull this down because it was an XML format and you could look at it. And so the, the organizations that Sheila said sort of stepped in at that point and said, okay, Five is not enough. Five categories is not enough to tell us really about the kind of work that goes into science. We need more. Like, let's expand this to 14. Let's work on this. Let's see how inclusive this can be. Let's try to get journals to adopt it. And they did a lot of work both formulating that and then getting journals to adopt them. And I think about 200 journals have adopted them now, um, that taxonomy. Now, that taxonomy is not perfect, and it's definitely geared towards the biomedical sciences. So taking that and trying to apply it to the humanities and to some social sciences is still fraught with peril, um, but it moves us in that direction of sort of accountability and credit that is much more precise than just dumping 12 authors onto a byline and walking away. Sorry, that was probably more than you wanted, Micah. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm, I'm learning so much, thank you. Um, uh, we have a, a, a viewer listener, uh, Avon HC, who said that they use credit for a publication and was told that that actually made it easier um, for a publication on a job application, and that made it easier for the committee to see what this person had contributed, which is exactly what this should be doing. Um, and that's that's a problem right now, given our, our structures. So, you know, I serve on the, the campus level promotion and tenure committee. And so you're coming with all of these different disciplines coming together. And what we're seeing over and over again is people saying, oh, they were a middle author too often. Maybe we shouldn't give them tenure. Maybe we shouldn't reward them because they were in this middle authorship. And we know first and last are good, but we don't really know what middle's doing. Well, that was fine when you had three authors, but now the majority of authors are middle authors. And disregarding all of their contributions because they're not a dominant author is really problematic. And so what this allows us to do is to say, hey, I am really the technician, I'm really good at this, or I'm really good at visualization, or I'm really good at statistics. Here's my kind of contribution. And this is why the team needs me, right? This is the role that I play. So I think it's really important in that way. Yeah, Sheila, I don't know if you can see, but I pulled up your paper on uh, applying climate risk, climate change risk management tools to integrate stream flow projections and social vulnerability. Um, I was wondering, I, sorry, I should have told you I was going to do this. But I, you're the first author on, on this paper. I'm wondering if yeah. you could describe, and I'll, I'll scroll down in a second to the acknowledgement section, which will bring us back to Cassidy's work. But I'm wondering if you could describe, when I'm looking at this, topic sounds interesting. This is something I care about. Um, uh, the abstract looks good. You know, the field I'm not familiar with, but I can parse it out. But I see, you know, you, Kelly Suttles, Bethany Cutts, a couple other uh, people, um, and James Voss at the end. What, what does what does that list of names mean when um, you all wrote it and submitted this paper? So this paper is like an interesting one to pull up because I think it like there's an important story behind this order that I actually learned something very valuable <laughs> um, uh, through this experience. So, so, so I led this study um, and I wrote the, pr the paper primarily uh, and submitted it um, and I'm the corresponding author. So I handled all the communication with the journal and like responses to reviews and things like that. So that's, you know, the first authorship part that we mostly understand. Kelly Suttles uh, was my colleague at the Forest Service here in North Carolina, and she, um, this study was based on some of the, oh, <laughs> was based on some of the work that she did. Um, and I couldn't have done this study without that work. So um, she, has a very important contribution. And then Bethany, Ryan, Katie, 
David and John, they all like provided like significant feedback, but also like helped talk through some of the direction of the study and like how I was analyzing the results, um, what I was looking at, and then like how to, um, you know, explain the results. And then Jim is my boss. And so typically in my field, at least, um, as a PhD uh, graduate student, what would typically happen was like the mentor of the first author would go last. However, um, like in talking to Jim, I guess it was actually not forest service policy for that to be the case. And so I didn't realize this until like after it was too late, um, but you know, Jim did have some questions from other people at the Forest Service that is like, well, why are you listed as last author? And I, it was just like a miscommunication, even though we're in the same field, like, yeah, that miscommunication was made. So <laughs> I definitely learned to ask about that, um, you know, my, my new uh, advisor, um, I talked to her about, you know, author order and, and we make sure we're on the same page before we will submit an article. So I definitely learned my lesson from that paper. That, that, that's such a, uh, yeah, thank you so much for telling that story. I, that that um, illuminates so much, right? And I'm, we can imagine that that happens on every single paper, right? I was, yeah. lo I was looking for, there's a really great lab manual from, um, I like, the GitHub pages site is down now, so I can't pull it up, but it's a, a molecular bio something uh, a researcher in California. And in her lab manual, they say, this is how we will assign authorship on papers. Um, so they, they like even, and it's a public lab manual, right? So um, another example of open science and practice. Um, and they use, there's a, Cassidy, maybe you know this, there's a, a standard, um, international journal manuscript editors do you know what i'm talking about there's a standard for how who, I who does i that's it yeah, yeah can you tell us a little about it <laughs> well again this was at the same time as the contributorship stuff so the international committee for medical journal editors um got together and they said we need to figure out what constitutes authorship so they came up with this list and they said okay you have to have either you know, either have written the work or have substantially edited it, engaged with it. Basically, you have to have read it <laughs> because so many things were being submitted that people just hadn't even read the whole thing. And when cases of fraud or misconduct came up, they're like, oh, I never saw that. It's like, okay, well, to be an author, you, you can't say that. You have to be accountable for doing that. And then you have to do sort of one of the main tasks. Did you do the analysis or did you conceive of the design or did you do, right? So did you do one of those things? So it's a list of all the kinds of things that you have to do. What's fascinating is the fifth category says that you have to be aware of and effectively have trust in the contributions of all of your other co-authors. So it makes you say, yes, I, I trust that what my co-authors did is accurate. And again, this goes back to that misconduct of not just being able to say, oh, well, I didn't know what they were doing with the method. So again, that scales at three to five, but it becomes really complicated at a thousand, right? Um, to really say that you know and can verify that the work that was done by your co-authors is of high quality. Yeah, that's uh, super helpful. Sheila, sorry, you were gonna jump in. Oh, I was, I was just gonna say um, with the paper that you had shared that I had written, I think and now that I've talked more and learned more about credit, I think for me, like as someone, like as an early career researcher, um, you know, writing papers, I think at that time when I wrote that author contribution statement, I, I was like, I want to make sure I have this, but I didn't realize that credit taxonomy existed. And I also have realized now that not all journals ask for that. And um, there was actually, I feel like in one of the papers, and maybe this was the, pap the paper that you had shared previously, I think 
it has the author contribution statement on the website, but maybe it wasn't like included in the paper, which is what I was also like, I don't know why they didn't include that. Um, but it's like what happens in the editing because like I have it in the proof. So it's like things to also look out for is like making sure that things don't get taken out of the proof when you're like publishing something. Um, or like you understand where that's going. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have up your uh, another bit. I'm just like showing off Sheila's work. Um, transitioning. This sounds really cool, Sheila. Transitioning ma machine learning from theory to practice and natural resources management. Super exciting work, Sheila. Um, and the acknowledgement statement, I could see that you, um, it looks like you're closer to using the credit terminology there. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I think this, I think this one, I maybe still didn't know it was credit, but I like looked at another paper that I saw that was like, you know, oh, this makes sense to me that like they would be organizing it in this way. And so, I, you know, it's just like every, I, we were talking about this last time, but every, or maybe it was the first session we had of reproducibility it's like every time I do something then for the next step I'm always like okay next time I'm gonna do it better and I'm gonna do it this way so it's like every time I try to like push push a little bit towards open science <laughs> so open and reproducible science yeah yeah um Douglas is saying that um he was in a math major and the professors said that authorship in journal articles was ordered alphabetically that's true in some fields, right, Cassidy? Yeah. So mathematics is one of the only remaining um, fields and economics. And usually for economics, it's more the econometrics, so less the applied economics, which have taken on that more junior scholar at the beginning and PI at the end kind of model. Um, but mathematics still does evoke um, alphabetical authorship. But even among that, so there was a study done a couple of years ago that looked across all web of science papers to look for alphabetical ordering. And even among mathematicians, it's decreasing as collaboration size in mathematics is also increasing. Um, so it's it's still it's still there, but it's um, it's being challenged. Um, there's so much I, I want to do in like twelve minutes. So um, <laughs> I, I, we um, Cassidy, we always try to give a balance of. Uh, talking about open science, but we're, we're wissenschafting it right here. So um, we always try to give a, a humanities example also. So the one that you're seeing on the screen is um, Immersive Scholar, which is a project that I worked on. And Cassidy, you might not know this, but the the thing that we were incubating at the Triangle Skullcom, um network a while ago was how do we use Tadira, which is a, a taxonomy mm -hmm. in the humanities, taxonomy for digital research activity activities in the humanities. How do we use that to talk about contribution? So for this project, Immersive Scholar, basically what we did was came up with a contributorship methodology that combines credit and Tadira. Um, and then we wrote them in um, machine readable and human readable language. So what we're looking at now is the, uh, the, the human readable version of the coded glass contributions. Um, you can see I just you know wrote out what people did, but I was using um, the language from Tadira and from Credit, and then we wrote it in a JSON file also. Um, all of this work is like totally unnecessary because there's like, this is a, a file sitting on an open science framework site connected to a, a Mellon grant that we just finished. But it felt so um, important to, to like start to stake that claim and say there are better ways to talk about contributorship and collaboration and someone has to start doing it. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know what happens with this stuff, but we, uh, we've started to do it. Um, so the other thing that I want to get to, Cassidy, is your work around acknowledgments. Um, and then how that has, I'll cl click back over to the other paper, how that, um, how your uncovering gender disparities in, in academic labor um, through acknowledgments. Do you think you can do that in a couple of minutes? I'll, oh, totally. I, I know. 30 seconds. I know 30 you can. Seconds. Go ahead. 
No, well, so I'm going to go back a little bit because this is why I think that the work that you're doing um, in the humanities is so critically important and actually informs the conversation around authorship in the sciences um, writ large. So there's a, a fabulous book, many of you may have seen it, um, called The um, Invisible Technician, um, work by Shapen. And what Shapen actually is doing is showing that over the course of the 20th century, we started to acknowledge the work of invisible labor that was happening in the labs. So there's many, much of the work that's happening in your spaces are happening by, you know, apprenticeship trainees, all of these sort of junior scholars in the space. And for a long time in the 20th century, it wasn't common to include them in the authorship list at all. So what we do have is we do have increasing team sizes just because science is getting more complex and interdisciplinary. So we have these growing team size, but we're also starting to acknowledge more of the people who are always doing the work. So in some ways it's the team sizes are getting bigger. In other ways, the bylines are just starting to acknowledge those people who were there before. Now, as Micah said, we have a section of papers that says acknowledgements. And what's fascinating is to look at the difference across those in different fields, where in one field, it may say, I'd like to acknowledge Micah, who did all of the data collection, the statistics, and the analysis, yet isn't listed on the paper, where in another field, all of those people would be authors. So the kind of work that you have to do to warrant authorship varies significantly by field. Um, I think the humanities is a really interesting example, particularly if you look at those humanities that are close to the social sciences. So in sociology and history, the acknowledgements will often say, you know, thanks to my doctoral student who did all of the work in the archives, coded all of the data, but I wrote the book and I'm the single author on this book. Whereas in another field that obviously would have warranted authorship. Um, so a lot of what we're thinking about with contributorship is also revealing that invisible labor. So that invisible labor, is largely um, younger in academic age. So it's definitely an exploitation of the sort of apprenticeship process. But what we've also noted is that um, there is a gendered notion to this as well. So women are disproportionately aligned with certain tasks in the research um, that are undervalued, that are often releg relegated to middle authorships that are more of the technical um, support role. What we've seen over time though, when we take credit, so in our first studies, we were just looking at this five-part taxonomy, which had did the experimentation, the analysis, conceived of the data, provided resources, or wrote the paper. And we found that there was only one category in which women were disproportionately likely to appear, and that was in experimentation. But when we took the credit taxonomy, which breaks that open, we find that women are disproportionately associated with writing the original draft, whereas men are doing the reviewing and editing. So whereas it looked like men were writing the paper, women were actually doing the um, first draft, the full first draft, whereas all the male authors on the paper were associated with the reviewing and the editing, which falls into that ICMJE thing. Um, we also found that when you broke open experimentation, you got the analysis and the data curation and the data collection, and you got this much broader spread of things, which reinforced that women were really the hands of science. They were doing the scientific work. They were the heart of the scientific activity yet they're disproportionately located in these lead dominant authorship roles of this first or this last, which is generally your senior author. So at the intersection of age and gender, we see these disparities happening and who's getting acknowledged for work. So part of this movement towards open science and contributorship is really to reveal that labor and say, all right, so that author got on for reviewing the paper, that's their only contribution, yet this woman was associated with four different tasks and is third author and is not being recognized in terms of the scientific community for their contribution. So part of that is, is what we're hoping to reveal with contributorship. Th that's, Did that cover it all? <laughs> yes. Um, and I was, I was scrolling through the, the graphics in the, in the paper, which um, were, I'm a visual learner, so they were helpful for me in, in like thinking about what's actually happening here. Um, Sheila, did you have any follow-up questions? There's something I want to mention on the humanity side, but you, go ahead. Well, I have a, it's not related to the results, but it is, I guess, related to like the analysis. I, I'm just thinking like how, like I know that you have some way of going about like getting at the gender of folks, but how do you like think about that in terms of like, I mean, cause we don't typically say like, this is the gender I identify with as I'm publishing this paper. So like how, how do you go about like addressing that? 
in the, yeah, these types of studies? That's a fantastic question. Um, so what we're using for all of this is name-based gender inference methods. So we're taking census data and for, for our work, we also take country-based list and we look at the country of origin so that we have a gene in the US as being female and a gene in France as being male. Um, and okay. I should say man and woman um, here because we're looking at the gender and not the sexes. Um, so we, we use those things to try to look at the perceived gender of the author. Now, as you said, that is not their self-identification in any way, but that is going to be largely the perception of those who are reading and reviewing it. So that's sort of where we fall in there. Okay. Um, now, it is it is highly problematic in, in many different ways that you bring up. And one of course is the binary aspect of it is that you know, we're using census data. So we're looking at, you know, have a certain threshold, you know, Mary 90% of the time is associated with people who identified as female on the US census. So we're sort of playing with that, but of course we know nothing about that actual individual. Um, I think the irony of our gender disambiguation algorithm is that I, and we also do race and ethnicity inference too, I come across as an Asian male, right? Cassidy is a male name, Sugimoto is an Asian name, right? So I, I, I am, I embody the errors of our, our disambiguation algorithm. But what I would go back to, um, and there's a great book, I would like to recommend it to everyone. Um, okay, two different books. Um, one is called White Logic, White Methods um, oh, yeah. by uh, Tukufu Zuberi and Vanilla Silva and Thicker Than Blood, How Racial Statistics Lie um, by Zuberi. And one of the things that I love about this is it's talking from the notion of race, but I think it really applies to the gender work that we're doing too. That these classification systems have been embodiment of power dynamics. And in many ways, they continue to perpetuate some of the disparities that we see. So they can be tools of oppression. But those classifications are also really important for us to provide the empirical evidence necessary to create policies and practices that change those kinds of power dynamics, that change those disparities that we see. So I think we can both at once acknowledge that, for example, US census race categories are highly problematic. We can critique and problematize that. But using them in social analyses allows us to um, make evident those disparities towards those people in power that have ability to enact change. And I feel the same way about our gender disambiguation algorithm. I wish that we weren't still in this gender binary. I wish that we were still not talking about it in this way, but our data has allowed us to reveal some of these disparities um, in ways that I think moves us forward. So I would love to come to a point where it's no longer necessary to do that, um, but yeah. we're not there yet. So in until we can overturn these classifications and these hierarchies, they can be useful for us in that in that movement and that progression towards that. That's a great question, Sheila, and thanks so much, Cassidy. Um, that yeah. will lead really great into our our topic next week on um, doc documentation, diversity, and Darjeeling. Um, a great comments uh, discussion going on between Douglas and Avon HC about how to include student research assistance in projects and um, the I was gonna, okay the opportunities of citizen science right the challenge uh, difficulty whatever word you want to put there um, but I am chairing a meeting at 1 p.m. so we can't get into any of that which is such a bummer. Um, the humanities example that I wanted to bring, and I'm really not trying to toot my own horn here, but the digital we hosted a conference at Florida State years ago called Invisible Work in the Digital Humanities, and um, sort of the the proceedings um, became a special issue of Digital Humanities Quarterly, um, with a bunch of our colleagues uh, writing about the challenges of invisible work in the digital humanities too. So this brings it back to um, the, the, this trajectory that we're on toward openness in, in research um, is multidisciplinary. It is really about um, what we do in universities and how we do it better. Um, so that's the thing that keeps me, uh, that's the thing that makes me come into the office and um, drink tea with you all. Um, do we have concluding statements, Sheila? I just wanted to say thanks, Cassidy, for joining. I learned so much from you, and I'm excited to read more of your papers. <laughs> so. Thanks for having me. This has been 
A pleasure. Micah, anytime, shoot me an invite. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you both so much. Uh, it's been really fun. Stay in touch and everyone stay healthy. And uh, listeners and viewers, we hope to see you next time. Yeah, go ahead, Sheila. Also, thank you, Claire, our chat moderator. And also my friend Douglas, thank you for joining. Oh, Douglas! <laughs> Douglas. Uh... <laughs> so, all right. Y'all take care. In the chat. Bye. Thanks.